there's a lot of fear and anxiety. A lot of CEOs now are like, huh, AI is really productive. Let's do AI layoffs. Now we can fire all the human software engineers and have AI do work for us. You're a student or early career professional who looks to become a software engineer in this age of AI. What do you actually do? So today we're gonna to talk about how to become a software engineer in the AI era or in this age of AI, how do you become a software engineer? And now this has been probably two of the hottest topics over the last couple of years where it's like AI might take over software engineers or is it worth it to be a software engineer if AI is gonna take over and do our jobs? Or there are other people who are like, AI is just a tool and software engineers are gonna become way more productive with all these AI tools. And if you're a student or early career professional, you're balancing these two things where you're like, oh, I want to get into AI, but I'm scared it's going to take me. And how do you balance the two? And so there's a lot of hype and a lot of anxiety at the same time. And hopefully throughout the speech, I want to kind of calm everyone's nerves and show at least how to go about it. And by doing that, I'm going to first start off with talking about what do software engineers actually do on almost like a fundamental level, the roles and responsibilities and career path. Then I'm going to talk about AI, what it's able to do, its capabilities and limitations. And then at the end, it's going to be a balance of the two of how to navigate this world, basically answering the question, how to become a software engineer in the AI era. So first thing, what do software engineers actually do? And I broke it down into an A, B, C, and D, just so it's easier to remember. And I want to really answer this question because a lot of people say AI is going to take over software engineers because they think that software engineers only code 24-7. But truthfully, there are many roles and responsibilities of a software engineer. And as I'm going through them, I want you to really think, will AI be able to take this over? Or how do I navigate this? I want you to try to answer the question for yourself as I'm going through it. So the first thing, what do software engineers actually do? The first thing, A, architect. A simple example would be, I want one of my friends to make butter chicken for me. Okay, I want to eat. No person who is making this dish for me is going to start just throwing the butter, throwing the chicken into a pan and start creating something. No, what a logical person does would be like, huh, Okay, you want butter chicken? Let me see if I have the ingredients. Let me see if I have the pots and the pans. Let me see if I need to go to the store. Let me take an inventory. Let me plan as to how I'm gonna do this. See if, if I'm even able to do this or I need to search for a recipe. We plan in advance of doing something. Similarly, when you're a software engineer, before you write a single line of code, you need to determine what the architecture is gonna be, what the design's gonna be. For example, if I was a software engineer at Amazon back in 1999 and someone came up to me and was like, I want you to create create a website for users to purchase products on and then get delivery two days later. Simple what Amazon does. Before I write a single line of code, before I touch Java, before I touch Python, JavaScript, any of those languages, at first I'm like, huh, First, I need to think about, okay, this website, what is it gonna look like? What's the color scheme like? Is it gonna be something I scroll on? Who's gonna use it? Do I use it on my mobile phone? Do I use it on a laptop? What is the UI architecture gonna be like? On the flip side, I also have to look at the back end. What is the performance of this? Is this gonna be something used by 100,000 people? What is the architecture? What database schema do I have? So before I write any code, I need to think and architect through all of those layers. The next thing is software engineers build. And I specifically use the word build, not code, even though that's what it typically translates into, because this thing coding, building, can be seen in many different lights. It could be punch cards. It could be assembly where you have to write 15 lines just to print hello world. It could be in your Python. It could be Java. And if you haven't been living under a rock for the last two years, it could be an AI writing in natural language to generate code. So software engineers actually will do the building part of like, creating the website, whether it's in Java, Python, or using AI, or creating code, creating the database schema. Whatever they architected, they'll then build. The third thing is collaboration. In software engineering, there's a lot of collaboration. We're not just coding like hermits, you know, like in those movies, the cyber guy with this hoodie and like go coding, coding, coding at the back. No, software engineers collaborate a lot. It might be that I talk to a product manager to find out customer requirements. It might be I talk to quality engineers to find out performance and scale considerations. I could talk to UX architects to determine how the UI is gonna look. A lot of different people that involved in the software engineering workflow that typically isn't accounted for. 
And then finally, D, debug. And this could be many different things. It could be as simple as making your button two pixels wide. It could be as your whole site crashes and have to fix it at 3 a.m. in the morning. A lot of different roles and responsibilities for a software engineer. And now we get into the question about AI. What is AI? What is AI doing? How will AI essentially take over software engineering roles or supplement software engineering roles? And for that, I have this little chart right here. Really quick, if you want to become a software engineer in the era of AI, you need to learn how to work with the tools that are changing how we build. Because the engineers who know how to orchestrate AI, not just code, are the ones who will stand out. And one of the best examples of that right now is inside Notion. Notion just launched something called the Notion Agent, and it's all about helping you move faster. You can tell it to summarize your team's stand-ups, turn them into a weekly update, and it will search your workspace, read the notes, write the draft, and update your DAW. It takes care of the execution so you can focus on the strategy. And if you're a computer science student, you can use it the same way. Ask it to organize your class notes into a project plan, create a summary of your coding assignments, or turn your brainstorming ideas into a polished report. You still provide the logic and direction, it just makes the process faster and cleaner. That's what being a modern software engineer looks like. You don't hand over your thinking to AI, you use AI to extend what you can do. The Notion agent learns how you work, adapts to your style, and becomes your teammate. This is the future of engineering. Humans handle creativity and judgment, AI handles the repetition and execution. When those two things come together, that's when real progress happens. If you want to experience that for yourself, try Notion Agent. It's available now on desktop, web, and mobile app. Link for it in the description down below. And now back to the video. This is the impact of AI in society. And I'll explain it through. So first we start off at ground zero, the initial part of AI entering into the marketplace. This is typically what you've seen as like your, the first launch of GitHub Copilot, the first launch of ChatGPT, 2021, 2022, when the hype was starting to rise. And as the hype starts to rise, we see other advancements like Claude, like Cursor, like Replit, Windsurf, you name any AI tool, any SF AI startup, everyone has an AI startup at this point. So there's a lot of cool, cool things that are happening and the expectations are inflating. At the same time, there's a lot of fear and anxiety. A lot of CEOs now are like, huh, AI is really productive. Let's do AI layoffs so we can focus more on AI agent creation. Or we'll say, oh, our productivity has skyrocketed. Now we can fire all the human software engineers and have AI do work for us. Or there might be announcements like Google has 25% of their code AI generated or Microsoft has 30% of their code AI generated. And then a lot of people think that their careers are over because AI can do all this and the inflation or inflation of expectations keep going up and up and up, but eventually it will peak. Right now, I would say we're close to a peak. I don't know if we're at a peak, but we're definitely up there or at least almost getting up there. And eventually we'll get crash down. The expectations of AI, AI capabilities, and its limitations moreover will be exposed and will enter into a trough of disillusionment. Now, why is that? It's because AI has significant limitations. I got this from a TED talk where it was talking about AI is an autocomplete with a PhD in everything. And if you really think about it, it's true. AI is really smart at knowing a lot of different things and auto-completing for it. It knows everything about geography. It knows everything about computer science, everything about mechanical engineering, bioengineering, biology, medicine. Like it knows everything in all those different fields. However, the limitation is it is still an auto-complete. These large language models are designed to be an auto-complete. For example, if I ask ChatGPT, I want a peanut butter and it'll say jelly sandwich, right? Logical complete. Money is the root of all evil. It has seen so many examples of that. It is trained on everything on the whole internet and thus it becomes an autocomplete for everything. However, the biggest lacking of it all is human creativity, innovation, and nuance. For example, if humans didn't intervene with it at all, 100 years from now, maybe the most popular sandwich isn't peanut butter and jelly, it's peanut butter and honey, or peanut butter and ketchup, whatever it might be. That human level of nuance, creativity, and what makes human human is solely on the human level. AI lacks that. And so why does it enter into a trough of disillusionment is when companies lack human creativity and innovation, which is the biggest propelling factor of 
growth, it's not just sheer productivity, it's the creative juice and elements, then companies who lay off a lot of software engineers and don't have humans and only have mainly AIs, they will start to suffer in comparison to companies with humans and AI. In that you want, you know, when you talk about quality and quantity, AI is really good at generating a lot of high quantity in that it can generate a lot of code and it can be pretty good. But the quality of the human element, the creativity and the nuance is solely on the human level. Then you enter into a world of enlightenment and ultimately a plateau of AI productivity because it works in conjunction with human creativity to accelerate technological growth. So then begs the question, what do software engineers do after AI has plateaued in productivity and we're working in conjunction of AI? Well, once again, you got your A, B, C's and D's. Architect, build. I put a line here because these two go very hand in hand together. And like I mentioned before, I talked to many executives and have done a lot of interviews in relation to that. And the biggest thing that I've gotten about how AI is heading over is software engineers are going to become software managers over teams of AI agents, or you can think of them AI software engineers, AI coder, in that humans are architecting or problem solving, potentially even in conjunction with AI iterating on problem solving and coming up with the solution that they then prompt to AI agents to do on our behalf. And now naturally the question I beg, okay, if we have software engineers doing that, then you kind of need less of them. Like why would you need so many software engineers to do that? Well, I like to think of it like this. Say you have 10 software engineers who can each deliver one feature. We have 10 software engineers on a team and they can each deliver one feature. So that means that team as a whole can deliver 10 features. If I have 10 software engineers or 10 software engineers managers over teams of AI agents, maybe the productivity skyrockets such that every software engineer manager can now deliver 10 features. And now a team of 10 human can deliver 100 features as opposed to 10 features and productivity skyrockets. And it can get exponential as you keep growing and growing and growing. And so humans will still be architecting and building over teams of AI agents. And still the collaboration and debugging stage will continue. Humans will continue to have different interests. Humans are really good at finding problems. They'll find any problem in anything that they can do. For example, like in soccer, you know, no one remembers how many goals the goalie saved. They only remember how many that they missed because humans are great at problem finding. So trust me, there'll be a lot to debug, a lot of problems to solve. And they will continue to do that because there will continue to be new technological problems with every innovation. There's more problems. For example, even with AI, there's a lot of concerns with regards to the security of a lot of things. A lot of opportunities are going to be developed through and through that. There's going to be a lot of problems and a lot of software engineering work that still needs to be done. When you're a student or early career professional who looks to become a software engineer in this age of AI, what do you actually do? So once again, software engineering doesn't change. The state of the specific nature of your work or how you might work or whether you're coding in your languages, your toolings might change. The fundamental of what a software engineer does, engineering software, these A, B, C's and D's, they don't change. And so if you're looking to become a software engineer, you need to start acting like a software engineer. Now, what does that mean? I actually, I recently saw this one video where it's like, if you wanna become a software engineer, create a startup. Create a startup because worst case, you'll get the job. Best case, your startup will be successful and you won't even need the job. Now, if we dissect that a little bit, what does that mean? Startups at the end of the day are solutioning to problems. They find a problem out there in the world and create a solution to them. And because we're all in tech here, that means creating a technological solution to that, using our expertise in coding, our expertise with AI to come up with a solution. So first we need to architect solutions. Say for example, y'all are students here, we find a local mom and pop shop and they still use written inventory or there's a non-technological club, they need help with their RSVPing or dashboarding or some issue. Use your knowledge with AI tools, say like Cursor or Replit, and say, hey, this inventory issue or this dashboard issue, if I can create a product that solves this, that can eliminate your need to do X, Y, and Z, and could potentially increase your revenue growth by this amount, would you be interested in that? They probably would. Then you can then create that product very quickly with all these AI tools that you have at your disposal on your laptop and create that for them. You build, you architect and then start building. And then maybe they want to buy it from you. Maybe they want to hire you as their own software engineer or engineer in general. And then thus you have a solution right there. 
The collaboration, before you get into the software engineering world, collaborating with as many people as possible. Here in San Francisco, the Bay Area, you have tons of meetups, tons of networking opportunities, tons of abilities to just meet people. Now the thing is, you need to architect and build before you get there. Because if you have nothing going for you, if you're a student just saying, please give me an internship, no one's gonna bat an eye. But if you say, hey, I've done X, Y, and Z, and I have driven revenue growth or stop loss at X, Y, and Z companies, all of a sudden you're much more high value. And in in fact, people might want to collaborate or reach out to you. The last thing is debugging and how this really looks for before you become a software engineer to become a software engineer is you keep iterating on your products. You might create a solution for mom and pop shop that works for one case, but if you want to keep on growing it, iterating it, finding out problems and iterating on it, there's so many problems to solve. You just have to keep going after it, after it, after it. And that's how the world of software engineering is going to turn into. And that's how you can prepare to be perfectly situated for that. Well, that's about all I have. Hope you guys took some value out of that.